Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is 94.1 KPFA presenting to you your Thursday evening program, Apex Express, and welcoming you on this beautiful Thursday evening. You know, slightly cool and nice. And we have with us four lovely ladies who are going to talk about the United States Social Forum, which was just held in Detroit from June 22nd through June 26th. And we have a very exciting program lined up for you. Also, tonight is a very special program because our entire our program will be spent talking about the United States Social Forum and these lovely ladies who work for different non-profits affiliated with Asian American organization and causes. They will be reporting back to us on the activities they did there and how these activities enhance uh, their outreach processes and also the organizations they work for. So welcome ladies. We have with us Melanie Tom, who is a former Youth Project Coordinator of Asian Immigrant Women's Advocates. Welcome, Melanie. Hi. We have Jenny Wu, who is a volunteer with Asian Immigrant Women's Advocate. Hello. Hi. We also have Kan Pham from the Making Contact of National Radio Project. Welcome. Thank you. And on the phone, we have Natalie Ji, who is a youth organizer at the Chinese Progressive Association. Hello, Natalie. Can you hear us? Hello, yes I can. All right, great. Now let me begin with you, Natalie, at the United Social Forum. And you work with the Chinese Progressive Association. Tell us a little bit about the association and then why you decided to attend the USSF of 2010. Okay, so the Chinese Progressive Association, we're a nonprofit grassroots organization based in San Francisco, California. Mm-hmm. And we also we work with the low-income Chinese immigrant community in San Francisco. We work directly with workers, tenants, and youth on issues such as workers' rights, housing rights, and health care. Um, some of our main strategies are organizing, advocacy, and education. Mm-hmm. And why did you decide to attend the USSF 2010? Uh- we wanted to give an opportunity to our members and our youth to learn about other issues around the United States and also co- connect our local struggles to national struggles. All right. Now, we also have, as I announced earlier, Melanie Tom, who's the former Youth Project Coordinator of the Asian Immigrant Women's Advocates. So, Melanie, tell us about your organization. Um, Asian Immigrant Women Advocates were, was founded in 1983 to improve the living and working conditions of Asian immigrant women. We have two offices, one in San Jose and one in Oakland. Mm-hmm. Originally, we organized hotel workers, but eventually we began to organize electronic electronic assembly workers Mm -hmm. and garment workers. Currently, um, we organize Chinese immigrant women in Oakland and Korean immigrant women in San Jose. Um, The purpose of us attending the United States Social Forum was to build both an individual and a collective consciousness for our membership. So in 2007, we were able to send two delegates to Atlanta, but we found that it was really just an individual experience for them. So this year, or starting in 2009, we made it um, a really purposeful um, intent on bringing all of our core youth leaders so that we could build a collective consciousness to move our program forward. All right. Thank you so much. And Jen Mei Wu, who is an volunteer with the Asian Immigrant Women's Advocates, uh, tell us a little bit about your organization and also why you did, uh, decided to, you know, uh, I mean, well, both of you are the same thing, but <laughs> as a volunteer, why you decided to attend this and then how did it help you? Okay, well, I was already um, actually going to go to Detroit on my own and also um, as one of the kind of representatives of API Equality in um, in San Francisco mm-hmm. and, um, and you know, first to the Allied Media Conference and then to the U.S. Social Forum. Right. So uh, traditionally, you know, the, the AMC is held every year in Detroit and it just so happened that the U.S. Social Forum was also happening. So a lot of people, you know, who normally come to the AMC also um, went to the U.S. Social Forum. And um, so I started initially kind of more, you know, as an API equality person, Mm -hmm. um, trying to make contact with other people working for uh, equal rights for LGBT people and um, also for 
um, uh, you know, people in the API community. Now, is this LGBT within the API community? Uh, yeah, absolutely, okay. absolutely. So um, we do education kind of um, to both, like, the mainstream queer community and also to the API community right. because both, you know, kind of... Um, you know, it, it's, it's useful to kind of talk to, to everyone and let, let people know that we're around. And then, um, and then I was talking to Melanie, um, and, uh, and Melanie needed some help with, um, the, uh, AWA youth, uh, chaperoning and, and, um, because we didn't have a very specific agenda for API equality while we were, uh, out at the social forum. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I wanted to help Melanie with the youth and that became kind of the, the main thing for that part of the, the second half of my trip to Detroit. Thank you. And finally, Ken Pham, of the, from the Making Contact of uh, National Radio Project, tell us a little bit about your organization and also why you decided to attend the USSF. Sure. <clears throat> so, Making Contact is a weekly radio program broadcast nationally on 130 radio stations, including KPFA on Fridays at 1.30. And we were just, you know... Ever since we went to Detroit last year, we've been really excited about coming to Detroit again um, because in addition to the Allied Media Conference and the U.S. Social Forum, the city itself is such uh, an experimental, it's just a, a real place of learning for mm -hmm. us. Um, it's a place that's kind of been ground zero for what happens in a post-industrial society and the kind of last gasps of capitalism. And, and there's some really exciting experiments happening people are really taking their 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 communities in their own hands and and we wanted to learn from what grassroots groups were doing in Detroit and also all from around the country and to amplify those stories um, nationally now going back to Natalie G who's uh, with the Chinese Progressive Association can you tell us what did you take away from the social forum oh we took away a lot of um, good experiences uh, overall, the U.S. Social Forum was very inspiring and a good way to connect our local issues mm -hmm. and struggles to, with other groups on a national level. Um, so we, uh, for our delegation, we brought 23 people, including adult members and youth members and some of our activists. Uh, we got there two days before the forum started, and we really saw kind of like Detroit before a lot of people came. So um, even in downtown Detroit, mm -hmm. we, we can really begin to see a community that's been really hit hard by the economy. Mm -hmm. It was really quiet, and you can see even some of the office buildings were abandoned or closed down. And um, on the second day there, uh, Labor Notes actually gave us a tour around Detroit. Right. Uh, we went through a few neighborhoods, and almost every box, there was at least three houses, if not more than that, that were abandoned, boarded up, or broken down. Right. And um, we also visit a factory called Packer Factory mm -hmm. um, that's been abandoned for, like, over 50 years. It was a huge factory, and now it's just sitting there empty, abandoned, and polluted. So seeing all that was a real eye-opener for me and... Um, my fellow peers because it really showed the effects of globalization and whatnot. And um, throughout the work throughout the US social forum we were able to see like some of the workshops showed hope in Detroit, showed um, people reclaiming their communities and um, overall it was just really inspiring. All right. And um, you know, the economic recession has hit Detroit really, really hard. And because of that did you were you able to get some more I would say I don't know if I should call them lessons or, or you know things that you would bring back to San Francisco here so that they could be incorporated in the CPI's agenda um, CPA's agenda um, yes like definitely uh, so some of the workshops that we attended um, it kind of showed like the highlighted part of Detroit like the real the real organizing aspect of Detroit where people are reclaiming their land, reclaiming their communities. Mm -hmm. We visited uh, one place called the Heidenberg Project right. and um, there was this artist who basically um, turned all the abandoned houses on his box into art pieces and that was, um, it was really amazing because like instead of just having um, like the abandoned houses that you would normally see in Detroit, and you just saw like beautiful art pieces that um, not, not only just like uh, showed how 
people were able to express themselves, but also to turn something negative into something positive. And um, some of the other things we learned about Detroit was mm-hmm. there's basically no supermarkets in Detroit. We have to drive like over 30 minutes to the closest supermarket, but there's over like 800 community gardens in Detroit. And there's this is, we're talking about Detroit, down, downtown Detroit, right? Um, not just downtown Detroit, just Detroit. Because, okay. um, the entire yeah. city of Detroit does not have supermarkets and you have to drive at least 30 miles, yeah. 30 minutes in yeah. any direction. Yeah. Well, it's, it was pretty like powerful to see that because like living in the Bay Area, we're so fortunate, fortunate to have like supermarkets or places where we can get local food grown, organic food and whatnot. But like in Detroit, it was for us, it was like, wow, like we couldn't even find like a grocery market nearby. Now that um, would definitely be, um, if our listeners already didn't know that, and that would be definitely an eye opener for our listeners. Yeah, definitely an eye-opener. I believe um, Jen Mibu, who's the who's a volunteer with the Asian Immigrant Women's Advocates, has a comment. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, one of the things we did, um, when we, I mean, I, I actually grew up in the Detroit area. Okay. And, um, you know, so I have a history there. And, and, um, and you know, my family actually left uh, Michigan because during one of the earlier cycles of, uh, of, of you know, recession. Um, and... Detroit's really been hard hit, and um, as Natalie was saying, you know, I mean, there's the the population of Detroit has decreased by fifty percent mm-hmm. um, since in the past fifty years, basically, and um, and that's that's pretty incredible because there's I don't think there's any other major city with the possible exception of New Orleans that has undergone uh, something like that, and um, and it's been going on for so long in Detroit. And um, and one of the things that was nice about the tour, um, and I think the the um, the reason Khan was pointing at me, <laughs> was because um, we took the youth on a on a tour. We we kind of um, uh, the the youth, our youth, and also CPA's youth were. Um, were presenting at the time that they'd had the official tour of Detroit, the API tour of Detroit. And so we kind of put together our own tour um, uh, with the generosity of uh, So Suzuki of the Detroit Asian Youth Project, Mm -hmm. who provided, um, who, who was our tour guide, basically. And so um, we went around and we saw a lot of the things that Natalie was talking about, but we also saw um, some of the um, farming that was done. Like we, we, we went to Brother Nature Farms um, where we saw an example of a place where um, they had basically reclaimed um, some, uh, you know, unused land and started farming and realizing um, uh, the the farmer at Brother Nature's, um, uh, Greg, I forget his last name, used to be a school teacher. And what he found is that he could actually make a living farming off of, I think, an acre or two mm-hmm. and uh, just selling greens to local restaurants and um and on the farmer's market, because as Natalie was saying, there there really isn't a lot of availability um, of fresh produce. And um, partly through the efforts of, of kind of grassroots people like, like here, I mean, I think it's very intentional. People, um, people have an agenda. They're thinking about policy. And I think in Detroit, it's kind of coming bottom up. It's like people have no food. And so they grow it themselves. Right. And, and so it's actually kind of a very different sort of movement in Detroit. Um, which actually kind of makes it kind of special and really powerful to see it. Because grassroots organizations, uh, the movement is starting grassroots because there is no other alternative. Right. It's not coming from someone with like a like an uh, an academic, um, you know, environmentalist perspective. People are actually forced into this because there's no other alternative option available. Yeah. I mean, it's not just that they're forced into it. I mean, they have the option of just eating only canned food or, or whatever. Right. But but um, but they see these opportunities and they become very apparent. So we did go to Brother Nature Farms and we and and um, and the youth did get a chance to kind of explore that farm um, and that was great and that was a functioning enterprise. But the the youth also we took them to a a, a church um, in uh, Detroit, actually mm-hmm. not very far from downtown Detroit, just you know like a five minute drive from downtown mm-hmm. Detroit. Um, still you know very much in the city and um, it was a predominantly African American church. And they had a farming program as well um, where they were teaching, um, uh, they had an entrepreneurship program uh, for some of the youth uh, there to kind of learn how to start a business. And they started doing their own little farm stand as well. And it's just really amazing seeing how 
um, uh, how, you know, uh, how different, I mean, we only saw two, two farms, but there are so many farms in Detroit and it's just amazing seeing how that has, um, kind of come from a very different direction than it's mm-hmm. come in the Bay Area and how it's like across the board, you know, people of different ethnicities, people of different classes, all caring about this stuff and how it has become very important. It's almost like they're able to create a new economy mm-hmm. that's not just based on the large um, corporate economy. Now, talking of economy, can farm of a national radio project. From a media point of view, you rarely ever hear of what Jen was talking about in terms of creating a local economy out of grassroots movements where people are actually forced to, uh, you know, create subsistence for themselves. Uh, you know, you always hear of GM failing and the bailout and all that happened and how foreclosures are on the rise, but you never hear of that. So what, in your opinion, uh, was something striking and that should be alluded to and that should be reported on as far as media goes? For me, Detroit really is a city of possibility. I think when people, when I mentioned I was going to Detroit, a lot of people immediately assumed despair, desolation. Um, They had heard really horrible things about Detroit, similarly Mm -hmm. to what they hear about Oakland. But, you know, when I actually felt incredibly inspired and really um, even just humbled and also even wanting to move to Detroit, it's, it's really inspiring what people are doing whenever they actually feel like they can take control and if they're no longer looking or waiting for the government to bail them to bail them out or for any you know five hundred one c three nonprofit to come up, I mean they're not doing it the way that in the Bay Area things seem to be approached. They're mm-hmm. they're really um, they're really creating the solutions. So taking the matter that, in their own hands that they need, and and there's a sense of real like excitement whenever you feel like you can do that. And I think because it's so cheap to buy a house in Detroit because of the the devastation you can buy a house for eight thousand dollars ten thousand dollars you can own land for what w- wouldn't be possible in the bay area people Absolutely. can actually buy land take it over even not buy the land but take over an abandoned lot and to actually grow something tangible in your hands is something that you know you can't replace that you know with all the kind of talk in the bay area there's something that is really hands-on that's happening in detroit that that mainstream media definitely isn't covering and we hope independent media like KPFA and Making Contact will cover more. Well, that is the reason we got you ladies on this show to talk more about that. And I believe uh, CanFam has some more. Yeah, one last thing I also was really inspired by was at the U.S. Social Forum, there were groups from around the country who were also taking back homes as part of Take Back the Land and also just their own housing organizations. They, I was so inspired by hearing stories of people in New Orleans and people in Texas, people all over the country who in really... Um, in small ways, but in radical ways, we're, we're saying there are rights to a home are more important than some bank's right to, you know, some bank's right to this house that's on paper, but they, you know, they, they were the ones who created this financial crisis and, you know, they shouldn't be the ones to be, they shouldn't own these vacant homes while millions of peop- people are homeless. And that was one of the, mo- the other inspiring thing I saw in Detroit at the U.S. Social Forum was people taking, taking control of homes and, and supporting their neighbors and taking control of homes. And now, Melanie, as a Jen and Ken and, and also Natalie were making points about uh, different grassroots movements which are going on where people are actually forced into it and also taking pride in, in getting involved in those movements. Where are women and API women in particular in this entire setup, in your opinion? Where, where are API women? Like, how are API women, Asian Pacific uh, Island women, how are they involved in this kind of, uh, these movements which are going on? Um, well, I think, you know... Um, and women in general. If women, women all over the world. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I think, you know, women are, are the, um, they're, they're expected to be leaders no matter what. So we're leaders in the home, we're leaders at work. And so even if, um, even when getting our young women um, to the U.S. Social Forum, we actually started a year ago Mm -hmm. and they took the initiative at a strategic planning session to decide to go as a group and to actually do grassroots fundraising and fundraise money to even get to the to Detroit. And I think, you know, we're talking about being in Detroit and what it was like being at the social forum, but we should also recognize that it took a lot of work for a lot of folks to get out to Detroit in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, so our youth actually um, 
engaged in a lot of grassroots fundraising, and they fundraised almost 30% of the total cost to go there through um, letter writing campaigns and karaoke contests. And I think that in itself is a huge investment on part of young people who are in high school who had never even been to the social forum, um, but just knew that it was something that they wanted to be a part of. So I think, number one, the leadership comes from um, making an investment in the organization Mm -hmm. so that there's a relationship between um, the membership and the organization, not that the organization is just taking the membership, but that there's a relationship between the two. Um, other types of leadership, um, I think when me and Jen May first started going to the social forum, the first couple of days was all API stuff, and we were hugely surprised in how we were able to gather with a lot of um, API grassroots organizations. And the first night, we were at this Chinatown exchange where some of our young women in our organization were able to meet with other, organi- or other organizers from other Chinatown organizations across the nation. Um, so that was really amazing. All right. Now, um, Natalie G, a question to you. One of the things that Melanie and, you know, Jen May and also CanFam referred to was, uh, you know, all these, all the activism that was happening, which is, which was not really activism as in an organized form, but more or less people forced into situations like that and then taking pride in, um, you know, doing grassroots activities like growing their own food or things like that. Uh, from a Chinese Progressive Association point of view and, you know, being a representative there, what kind of other API organizing did you see at um, the U.S. Social Forum in Detroit? Um, well, we, I think also, um, every, most people did too. We met a Chinese American activist, Grace Lee Boggs. Um, she was celebrating her 95th birthday with us at the U.S. Social Forum. And, um, she worked on a lot of anti-racist and feminist issues. And she did a lot of organizing around the African community, African American community in Detroit. And that was really inspiring to see and hear her say that. And, um, let alone just like a Chinese American activist. So, um, you know, you talk about Grace Lee Boggs and celebrating her 95th birthday there, and many of you, you know, of course, attended those celebrations. Uh, why is she such an inf- inspiration to you, Melanie? Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, you know, we brought all of our youth um, to her 95th birthday, and it was actually a huge impact on our membership and our, on myself. Um, just to see um, a Chinese-American woman um, up front speaking in front of a huge crowd of hundreds of people, and she's really just um, changed the dynamic, especially between Asian-American and African-American solidarity and the work that she did. It was just really inspiring just to even see a Chinese-American woman um being so respected and celebrated and I know some of mo- all of our youth are um, immigrants from China and Hong Kong so mm-hmm. even the perspective of coming to the United States and not really seeing any um, Asian American leadership promoted in, main- in any kind of mainstream form going to the social forum and seeing a woman um, so respected was just really amazing. Well, now that we are talking about Grace Lee Boggs uh, for our listeners we do have a special treat uh, we have a recording of Grace Lee Boggs who uh, she's talking at the Planet session at the Detroit National and at the USSF and you know we are config- configuring that piece right up for you and we'll be playing this piece in two parts we'll first play this for some time then we'll talk to um, the activist ladies who are with us and then we'll continue with the piece so let's hear Grace Lee Parks Wonderful to be here with Jerome and with Ron in general. I came to Detroit in 1953 when Ron was six years old. No, all, almost six. <laughs> almost six. And, and General was 12. And it was a very interesting city. There were still two million people here. The packet plant was still operating. You have to hold it up, Grace. It was uh, the Chrysler Jefferson plant where Jimmy worked, still had 17,000 workers. But things were changing. The two freeways were built in 1953, the Lodge and the Chrysler. 
And it was a very segregated city. I mean, you would be amazed. Lots could buy houses on land contracts, but they could not live in the apartments right next door. And when Jimmy moved in with me, we were evicted. But the, what was happening was that whites were leaving by the freeways, and very shortly thereafter, the apartments became vacant. So they were ready to rent them to blacks at twice the rent. And you have no idea how difficult, I mean, for those of you who were raised in the last few years, when we talked about having uh, blacks on the school board, when we talked about having uh, blacks as represent state representatives, it was as if the world were going to fall apart. You couldn't believe, and for, so as the whites left, and as blacks became increasingly the majority, what began to happen was the situation was <coughs> untenable. And so the black power movement came out of that situation. And it was led originally by black professionals like Reverend Clay, Jeremogi, and Milton Henry, and Richard Henry. And general didn't begin to emerge until about 1963 with the Uhuru young people. Uhuru being uh, freedom in Swahili. And Ron didn't emerge until the late 60s when he was one of the founders of the Black Panther Party. And to see Ron now leading the Peace Souls movement in, in Detroit after all these years. As a seat, be next to General on the platform. It's just amazing, I tell you. There's so much history here in the history of Detroit. And you, you have to understand the atmosphere as the plants were laying off workers because they were being replaced by robots and high tech. And young blacks were feeling that they were expendable. They weren't needed anymore for work. You should be able to drop out of school in ninth grade and get a job in the factory and make enough money so that you could raise a family and buy a home. And all that stopped. And so in 1967, all hell broke loose. The young people exploded. And we didn't know whether that was a rebellion or a riot or a revolution. It was the, the press and the police called it a riot because it was obviously a violation of law and order. We called it a revolution. And we thought everything had changed and that things would not be the same. But it was far short of a revolution. It was, it was a very righteous rebellion. Young people were not willing to become expendable. They were not willing to have a police force and to have the, the, the power structure completely white except for one or two people. And so they rebelled not only against race, but they rebelled against a way of production that was making them expendable. And I think to understand that rebellion and to understand how the power structure had to have a black mayor, because a white mayor could no longer maintain law and order. I, I, I'd like to say, first of all, is why you're all here. Because Detroit is a city of hope. Detroit is not just a city of poverty. It's not just a city of devastation. It's a city of hope. Because every time they do something to us, we find something else to do. 
and we scared the devil out of them with the rebellion. And they gave us a black mayor, and we discovered by having a black mayor that the problem wasn't just black. And the problem had to do with building up something new. And that's what we've been doing. That's why you're all here. Okay, hi. I think you... Detroit is a movement city. Every time we have a crisis, we see it as an opportunity. And I think I'd like you to take that back to your cities. That a crisis is an opportunity for you to create something new and something different. And so we don't just resist, we create something new. Hey, I, I just... Next question. Is it true that the mayor of Detroit plans to sell our vacant land for agribusiness? If this is the plan, how will community food movement defend itself? And that's Mayor David Bing. Just so y'all know his name. Chris. I would say that the mayor is too little and too late. <laughs> We are well underway with an urban agricultural movement. It was started by African-American elders mainly, who worked with Detroit Summer, who saw the land and vacant lots as opportunities, not only to grow food for the community, but to teach young people who grew up in the city uh, get a sense of patience and process. The Cultural Revolution came way before the mayor, and Mr. Hans is awfully little and awfully late. <laughs> and that, you're listening to Grace Lee Boggs at the plenary session of the United States Social Forum in Detroit. You know, in, in spite of her age, there's so much fire, there is, there's so much conviction to do something, change people, change the world. Now, let me begin with asking you ladies, uh, starting with you, Natalie G of the Chinese Progressive Association. Uh, are you still with us? Hello? Yes, I am. Yes, yeah. How does Grace Lee Boggs inspire you, personally and, and as an activist? Um, so, as a Chinese American woman, she was definitely inspiring because um, when you think of activism, you usually don't see Chinese American women in there. But um, she was inspiring because um, she was just that. And um, also seeing like the Chinese American women in our own organization at CPA, like our workers um, doing activist work, it's just like it gives. It gives me hope, um, personally, mm -hmm. to continue to do, continue to do the active, activist work that I do. All right. Now, CanFam of National Radio Project, how about you? <clears throat> Grace Lee Boggs. <laughs> and I'm, I must tell our listeners that, you know, as she's talking, her face is lit up and she's very <laughs> excited. Grace Lee so. Boggs makes my face light up. She, at 95, she is an inspiration. And not just because she's Chinese-American or because she's, she's Asian-American, but just as a human being. Her capacity for being able to integrate all these different movements and continue to learn. Even, even at 95, she's still studying. She's still writing. She um, she writes about how she's learned so much. She started out as a kind of a more traditional Marxist revolutionary and talks about how she's learned so much from the women's movement that taught her that the personal is political. Mm -hmm. From the environmental movement that taught that you can't just, you know, focus on workers' rights, but that actually you have to care for the earth. She's learned so much from the Zapatistas. Um, she's learned so much from the WTO corporate globalization, anti-corporate globalization activists. She's somebody who's continually growing, continually learning, and her ideas about love and revolution um, encompass so much. And I am really inspired by that vision. And um, 
um, yeah, maybe later I'll read a quote. I, I looked on your iPhone and found a quote. <laughs> well, there you go. So, technology being used here to, you know, find more inspirational words from a legend herself. Now, Melanie Tom of Asian Immigrant Women's Advocates, what, why does she inspire you personally and as an, as an activist? Um, you know, I think Asian Americans have a really unique position in this country in that we're used as the model minority. And so at times we're often portrayed nationally as conservative, um, economically conservative. And so the reason why Grace Lee Boggs is inspiring to me is because she represents a really radical Chinese American woman who has extremely strong politics and what I found really interesting you know when you think of like a 95 year old woman like she was speaking super clearly yes. at her birthday party yes. I mean we just heard the clip I mean she was on it and so when we were listening to her speak it was like I was hanging on every word she had to say and I think the other thing that really inspires me um, uh, inspires me is that she has such an investment in young people mm -hmm. um, and that you know at her birthday party, they had all these young people come back who are not young people anymore. They're adults. Right. Um, come celebrate her birthday party. And so her investment in building um, leadership and young activists for the future, I mean, that to me, that's that's incredible. Now, Jen May Wu of Asian Immigrant Women's Advocates, I'm going to you know take this away a little bit. Earlier when you were talking to us, you, you mentioned about the LGBTQ activism. Um, that was also a part of the social forum. Now, from Grace Lee Boggs, what kind of inspiration you draw within this LGBTQ context? Um, that's a harder question. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, uh, yeah, in terms of... Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not actually, I don't know. It's, it's, it's more that I see her inspiration more as a kind of, as a great leader and as someone who can be very inspiring from a social mm -hmm. justice perspective right. of which kind of the LGBT stuff is part of that. Definitely. And, she, and she's always been at the vanguard. And right now I think the, um, the LGBT, uh, rights issues are at the, um, are kind of a very, current issue where there are many people in this country who uh, you know I mean basically Grace Lee Boggs has been she's she's obviously been around for a long time and yes. she's seen a lot of change in this country and like I said she was always at the vanguard and there were many times like like she was describing in the recording that we just heard that um, it was a very segregated uh, community that, that she was in in Detroit uh, right. when she and Jimmy um, uh, got together and um, and, you know, she was saying that they got evicted from their place and that, um, that, uh, people felt that it was, you know, okay to charge, um, African Americans more rent. And, you know, I mean, the, just these things that were like so ingrained in society and she kind of, um, was there to kind of, uh, was one of the leaders, uh, leading the way, fighting that, um, kind of ahead of where maybe a lot of people in America were. Mm -hmm. And I think that in, in that sense, you can draw a parallel to kind of where we're at right now with, um, LGBT stuff because there are many, um, people here um, I mean, here in the Bay Area, I think a lot of people are very clued in on um, it being a civil rights issue, but Definitely. in many other parts, you know, many other areas, and some people here too, uh, don't see it that way. They kind of see things, you know, like, for example, marriage issues, you know, um, interracial marriage. Uh, there, there once were m many laws in this country, anti-miscegenation laws, um, preventing people from uh, different ethnicities uh, getting married, um, specifically whites and others generally. Right. And, um, and now, obviously, you know, with Proposition 8 and, 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 um, here in California and in many other states, uh, people see that also as an issue. Whereas before it was kind of like, you know, people were against interracial marriages. Now they're against same sex marriages. Right. And it's just like a, a progression of things. And I think that, um, one thing that, uh, that, that is, um, very inspiring about Grace Lee Boggs is that she's always, you know, it's not that just that she was at the vanguard at that time. It's just that she's always been at the vanguard and she's still at the vanguard. And, um, I think that's, that's really inspiring. Now, 95 years is a lot of, it's almost a century spent on the planet. And then you, you have seen, you know, within the past 20th century, and of course, you know, we are at the early part of the 21st century. So many changes have happened and drastic changes have happened, which have, you know, and turned she's the still, world around. And, and she's, she's, she's still a vanguard. I mean, like what she mentioned about the, about the Detroit summer program and the, um, African American elders being involved. I, one thing that I don't think that she mentioned in the recording is that Detroit summer is a program that actually came out of the Boggs, uh, Institute and Boggs, 
I don't remember what it's Bug called. Center. Bug Center. Bug Center. Bug Center. Bug Center. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's like she's still there. She's still there at the Vanguard. Like this movement that we were talking about that was so yeah. different and so special. She's there. Now, talking yeah. about the recording, um, we still have about a five more minute clip, which we'll play later during the show. And while, you know, of course, we are talking to the, la- you know, all you actress ladies here, one, one on the phone and three of you with, here with me in, in the studio. So let's turn the conversation away a little bit towards API organizing. Now, Melanie, Tom, would you like to shed some light on that? Um, API organizing. Um, that happened at the social forum. Ah, okay. Well, I think, so there's a couple things that happened. Um, we were very fortunate that we were able to come together nationally to make sure that folks knew what was going on in relationship to API organizing. So first, um, first, at least for youth, we had an API youth exchange where youth from all across um, the nation who are API came together to talk about common issues that they had in their communities. And so um, our youth were able to participate in that and um, really voice their concerns and also um, struggle with other Asian youth across the nation. Mm -hmm. Um, We're also able to have a plenary um, planned by the API Movement Building. And, you know, at first, the plenary, it, it seemed a little like it might not happen. It was far away in another church. There wasn't going to be a lot of transportation and they had like double turnout than what we expected. Right. And so it shows, I think people are really invested in moving moving forward and an API agenda nationally. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, we were able to participate in a Chinese organizing exchange where different organizations from like New York, Boston, LA, and the Bay Area were able to come together and talk about grassroots organizing and the common issues and challenges that we have. Um, so it was really interesting in coming to Detroit. You know, Detroit is predominantly African American, but like for the first three days of our experience in Detroit, we were with a lot. We were um, able to connect with a lot of our um, um, Asian American activists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Natalie G, would you like to add something to what Melanie Tom said? Um, so I was also there with, uh, or actually CT was also there where, when Melanie mentioned about the Chinatown exchanges. Mm-hmm. And, um, for us, uh, some of our members really got to connect to, um, the other members of the Chinatown organizations. Like our worker, um, workers were able to connect to, um, some of the, some of the members from CAV and APEN and our youth members were definitely able to connect to not just AWA but like CAV, CPA Boston and AWA Youth and we shared basically our organizing strategies and like you know how we can kind of learn from each other and incorporate the strategies into our own work. Okay now Can Farm of the National Radio Project what about API organizing from a media point of view? Well we focused um we're not an API organization, actually, but we did have a deep beat and interest in following the immigration track. Mm-hmm. There were over 60 different workshops that were related in some way to the issue of immigration, whether people were dealing with deportations and raids in their home communities or dealing with Arizona's new racist SB 1070 law, which right. mandates racial profiling of immigrants. Um, So we were following that and also really trying to connect with groups on the ground that were organizing and mobilizing and strategizing because, as we know, Arizona is just the the starting point for what the right is really planning um, to seed in in terms of an anti-immigrant movement across the country. And interestingly, nine other states have ratified the same law. It was in the news today. So, Yeah, we're in some really crazy times right now, I think, with a huge economic crisis. You know, I don't know, it's not even, it's an economic crisis, an economic crisis of massive proportions. There's there's a real backlash. And, and of course, people are not blaming the corporations or the banking industry, but they're blaming immigrants. And so as, you know, as a progressive movement, we really need to strategize and organize and, and figure out what's our response, because we know that people are going to be scapegoating immigrants, including API immigrants, but all of our immigrant brothers and sisters. And, and we need to be talking about how, about how we can do that. Now, interestingly, uh, you know, before before we seg into you know another part of our program, I wish to ask all all four of you, as in, 
Uh, I'm under the uh, impression that many international organizations attend also attended. You had many speakers like Vandana Shiva from India and some other speakers and also some organizations across the borders who came and attended the social forum. What kind of interaction went on there? Melanie? Um, you know what? I, I, at least for Asian immigrant women advocates, um, our focus was really on connecting nationally. Okay. Yeah, so we really didn't make any international connections. But I do think that in regards to the next step for organizing, transnational organizing is really where um, where we need to be, um, especially if we're, as, as an immigrant organization, it really just makes sense for us to connect with folks who are doing organizing abroad, especially since, you know, our people are coming from China, working here in low-wage jobs. We need to connect with other folks who are doing the same. Natalie Ji, uh, any comments on that? Um, ditto what Melanie said, and also uh, we want to try to build na- national solidarity, especially around the SD 1070 mm-hmm. that's happening in Arizona right now. Um, yeah. And I believe CanFam of the Making Contact of National Radio Project has an event to announce, yeah. which is particularly related to the immigrant rights. Yes, we have a U.S. Social Forum report back and happy hour uh, this thir- this coming Thursday, July 22nd in downtown Oakland. And we, there were so many different topics to focus on with the U.S. Social Forum. But for this one, we decided to focus to hone in on the immigrant rights track and organizing. And so we invited four different organizations, the National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, mm-hmm. Presente.org, the Center for Media Justice, and Mujeres Unidas y Activas. Uh, to talk about what kind of work they did at the U.S. Social Forum and coming back, how they pl- how they plan to move their work forward because this is a really critical moment um, for immigrants across the country and and we really need we wanted to share what what happened in Detroit and how can people get involved if if they weren't able to come to Detroit what do we need to do right now what's the next what's the next step to get involved now uh, talking about involvement um, how do people find out more about your organizations and also um, what went on from your organization's perspective at the social forum. Natalie G? Um, you can visit our website at cpsf.org, but also we're, um, we're going to try to connect our uh, local issues at all the community space to more of a global perspective mm-hmm. um, because we do have a youth delegation of six plus two staff who are about to go into China later this month. Mm-hmm to uh, learn about um, basically like the issues in China and how um, our issues in our communities that we face right now are also global. So kind of like the recent Foscon scandal, uh-huh. China basically play, plays an important role in determining how low-wage low workers across the globe will be treated. Right. And while American corporations like Apple, they make billions of profit in each year, workers in the U.S. and in China are paying with their blood, sweat, and tears. Right. And we know that this exposure trip uh, with our youth going, youth going to China, it will be the first step of many in understanding worker, tenant, and environmental issues in China. And mm-hmm. a first step for us to build a bridge and a true international solidarity with our brothers and sisters in China. Thank you, Natalie G. and Melanie Tom. Um, folks can visit our website at www.aiwa.org. And in regards to like processing our experience at the social forum, I think right now our membership is kind of soaking it all in individually. And they're going to come together during the summer to think about it strategically and how it will affect our youth organizing. Kanfa? People can come to our website, www.radioproject.org. We recorded hundreds of hours of speeches and interviews and where we we already created one one great voices program called crisis as opportunity mm-hmm. we took you know the best of speakers um of four different speakers from the u.s social forum including invincible and an a filipina activist and you know of really strong voices and brought them back to folks who couldn't come to Detroit. So if you want to check out that speech show, you can go to our website, radioproject.org, and check it out. Um, we're going to continue creating shows. We're still logging all the different hours of, of speech shows and speeches that we that we collected and, and going to turn it 
into into future programs to share with um, not just the Bay Area community, but all the different communities where Making Contact is broadcast. Thank you. Now, before we move on to the final segment of the Grace Lee Boggs talk, I wish to thank all our guests tonight, Natalie G of uh, Youth Organizer of the Chinese Progressive Association. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, Melanie Tom, uh, also a youth project coordinator at the Asian Immigrant Women Advocates. Thank you. Thank you. Jen Mei Wu, who's a volunteer at IVA again, Asian Immigrant Women's Advocates. Thank you for being here. Can I mention just one thing about API Absolutely. Equality? Yeah, um, just, just because we mentioned some of the stuff about API Equality, I just want to let people know about our website, um, apiequality.org. And in terms of uh, the social forum, NAMC, we were out there trying to gather ideas, connect with other creative people, because we're putting on together a, uh, a project called Project Q, um, which is open. You know, we're inviting people to come and uh, basically participate in a group uh, class over the next few weeks mm-hmm. um, uh, in terms of performing arts and writing, poetry, um, possibly some video as well. And if people are interested in that, again, uh, look at apiequality.org um, to get involved. You can take a class and learn a bunch of stuff and maybe even perform and increase visibility for uh, API activists. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And finally, Ken Pham of the Making Contact of National Media Project. Thank you all for being here and enlightening us on uh, the U.S. Social Forum, the activities there, and also uh, how they fed into your own activism and your organization's goals. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing all of you again so that we can talk to you and find out more updates. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And after this brief music, we will go back to the final interview, um, the final piece of the interview and the talk of Grace Lee Box. lessons for a strategy for revolution can we draw from Detroit's experience in history? I'd like to say that behind behind the strategies in Detroit that I have been a part of is an understanding that we're at a very different time on the clock of the universe. In the 1950s, Albert Einstein said, the splitting of the atom has changed everything but the human mind. And thus we drift toward catastrophe. And I don't think we've changed our minds sufficiently. Shortly after that, The people of Montgomery, Alabama carried on a boycott that lasted more than a year. And they didn't just, they were just angry. They carried it on in a way which was exemplary and should have changed the way that we think. Because they were new people carrying on that boycott. And that launched the whole civil rights movement. And I think we need to understand that we have to go beyond our opposition to projecting alternatives, to having a vision. You've heard a lot about how Detroit summer meant so much here in in Detroit. It was because we because Coleman Young challenged us. He said, you're just a bunch of naysayers. What is your alternative? And we created an alternative which was based upon encouraging and providing a way for young people to engage in rebuilding and redefining and re-inspiriting our city. And that was a turning point. That was a turning point. I think that to understand that we, ha- we are engaged in a struggle for two-sided transformation. We are not only transforming institutions, we have to transform ourselves. 
And that's a wonderful time to be, to understand that we are the, a place where we can advance the evolution of humanity. In fact, that we have to do that. And to have that in your mind as you fight a battle over food stamps or battle over whatever, or utilities, or water, they're shutting off your water. How to do that, how to develop a strategy to do that is our challenge, I think. And that was the inspirational voice of Grace Lee Boggs speaking at the U.S. Social Forum uh, for the celebration of her 95th birthday. Well, for the benefit of our listeners, we had a very special APEX tonight, which was a report back of various API organizations in the area of the U.S. Social Forum that was held in Detroit from June 22nd through June 26th. We have a couple of events to announce which relate back to this report back of USSF. The first in, uh, first one is the USSF report back happy hour against the 1070 and for human rights with National Radio Project Making Contact and National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. This event is being held on July 22nd, Thursday from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. The program starts at 5.15 at Mama's Vietnamese Restaurant, 365 19th Street between Webster and Franklin in Oakland. More information can be found at the National Project Radio Project's website. Also, the Chinese Progressive Association is hosting a youth talent show called Journey to the East at the Chinese Cultural Center in San Francisco next Thursday, that's July 22nd, from 7 7.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. More information can be found at their website at www.cpa that's Chinese Progressive Association dot org. Well, before we wrap up for tonight, I wish to thank Akal Jagbanan Singh, who helped us at our controls and also Free Will and Frank, who's standing here, who also helped Carl and me put this fabulous show up. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you again next week. Same time, same place, 94.1 KPFA or triple www.kpfa.org This is Amit Pindyal signing off. Good night.